Welcome to Libraries Today. This program is intended to recognize and highlight the unexpected ways local libraries serve their communities today. I'm your host, Stan Howe. West Virginia has produced a myriad of great authors. Pearl S. Buck from Hillsboro influenced a generation of writers and won the Pulitzer Prize for her book, The Good Earth. More recently, writers like Colwood's Homer Hickam, Denise Gardenia of McDowell and Kanawha Counties, and children's author Cynthia Ryland of Hopewell have inspired readers worldwide. Libraries have played a large role in the careers of many West Virginia writers, including our first guest today, West Virginia author Meredith Sue Willis. When we return, WVLC Library and Development Services Director Heather Campbell Schock will talk with Meredith about her writing and the influence the Mountain State has had on her career. We'll be back with Heather and Meredith right after this. They said I couldn't dream. Called me a piece of trash and swore that's all I'd ever be. Said a bottle couldn't see the ocean. Give up. Go back to the dumpster. But I didn't listen. I made my way. And now, I am what I've always wanted to be. Meredith Sue Willis is a writer, teacher, and public speaker. Born and raised in West Virginia, she is a member of the Appalachian Renaissance and has deep roots in her home state. She is the author of novels and short stories, as well as nonfiction on the subject of creative writing. Meredith, thank you for being with us. Thank you for inviting me. I'm really happy to be here. Oh, so Meredith, tell me about your path to becoming a writer. Um, I, you know, I, I teach writing, and um, there are two, two kinds of people. There are the ones who started doing it when they were adults, and I'm the other kind. I started when I was a little bitty girl. My dad was a, a high school chemistry teacher, and he used to bring home the long eight and a half by 14 sheets of paper, and I would break them up into boxes and make comic books. So I started writing comics pretty much before I could spell. And, uh, and then I wrote whatever I read. If I read a dog story, I would write a dog story. I might change the gender of the dog, but you know, it would be the same story, not very creative. And as I got older and I read more sophisticated things, I like to think I started writing more sophisticated things. So it's, I expect it's something that I will do until, I'm, until I uh, don't have the brain cells to do it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um. How has your West Virginia roots affected your writing? Um, well, um, well, most of, I, I, I think probably most of my writing actually is set here. Um, when I was growing up, there were a lot of questions in my mind, a lot of things I was interested in. And I've been, you know, working on them ever since. Uh, and every time I come down, my mother lived here until about two years ago, uh, and she just turned 100 this year. She's 100 years old, living in assisted living near me. But I was down a lot to visit my family. And every time I would drive down, uh, down Route I-81 and then across Route I-68 through, mm -hmm. through Western Maryland and then into West Virginia, where I'd always start singing one of the West Virginia songs. <laughs> uh, but it was so I was, I was constantly I in touch with what was going on and the changes going on. And I have very good friends who still live here. So it's always been, I mean, I write about other things as well, but it's always been one of the really important things I'm interested in. So of course I write about it. I write about mm -hmm. whatever interests me or whatever catches my attention. One of my novels, is that one here? Yeah, the one called Higher Ground. I know exactly when that one started. Um, I went for a walk with my mother and my, her sister, her older sister, up uh, 
uh, a little uh, run where they used to live in a mining camp, and there was an old uh, abandoned house with, uh, that we walked up to, and I got up on the broken porch and stared in the broken windows, and it just, just came to me to wonder who had lived there. And that was actually the beginning of, I mean, and there, that, that's not what the story was about, but it was the, it was the little um, grain of sand that got into my oyster brain and I started smoothing over and working on. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about your first book, A Space Apart? Yeah, um, A Space Apart is um, it, it's an interesting book in a lot of ways. Uh, one of them is that I didn't know much about West Virginia and Appalachia at that time, which has been always been interesting to me. On the one hand, I knew everything. I knew the smells, I knew the sounds, mm -hmm. I knew the people, I knew the language. But um, when I started writing that, I knew nothing about the history. They didn't teach. When I was growing up in Shenston, in Harrison County, we had wonderful teachers, but one of the things they skipped was um, West Virginia history. We, we did the parts of a grasshopper. Uh, and I think we learned, you know, we learned the state bird and the state flower and that sort of thing, but knew, knew nothing about the background of, we knew nothing about the mine wars. We knew nothing about uh, the, the struggles, you know, to, for people to make a living, about the exploitation of resources. So anyway, I wrote this book as if it had, had um, were not in time. It was as if it were set in a, uh, as it was as much a, a made up world as um, a science fiction novel or a fantasy novel. Mm -hmm. But and then after it was published, and um, I, I started coming down to West Virginia, where people were were thrilled with my success with this getting a commercial New York publisher, and people started telling me what I was wrong about, it, very gently. <laughs> I mean, it was no no one ever. I mean, you know, West Virginians. Yes. They, if they well, if, except for the ones who were big loud mouths, most of them are very very gentle about how they explain things. And it turned out one of, they would tell me maybe you ought to read. Did you ever hear of Davis Grubb? Did you ever mm -hmm. read Mary Lee Settle? And I hadn't. I hadn't. I knew. I didn't know. One of the reasons I left West Virginia was I thought you had to go to New York to be a writer. I didn't know you could be a writer here. So I started meeting writers from West mm -hmm. Virginia, and I started getting recommendations from librarians. The great. Uh, uh, Harrison County librarian Merle Moore, who, who founded the, the, that, our wonderful library up there, and uh, no relation Phyllis Moore, who's the uh, kind of the, the, the doyen of uh, West Virginia literature. Um, and um, they gave me books to read. And uh, all of a sudden, I realized that, that there, there was history and uh, economic situations behind the stories, uh, which doesn't mean that A Space Apart was not a it was a very sophisticated book, literarily, mm -hmm. but it, um, it, it's sort of like in a magical world, so it's almost, it's almost like magical realism in a strange way, although everything that happens could happen. Uh, and the characters are very West Virginian, and it certainly is true to my emotional life, but uh, my, in my later, later books, I began to realize that there was, there was a, a history and a background, and that has made all the difference for me, really. Where else do you get your inspiration besides West Virginia? Well, um, well, the truth is, some of my stories were actually set in southwestern Virginia, because <laughs> <laughs> because my grandmother uh, grew up down there, and in fact, my dad was born there. But my grandfather um, was a, 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 a school teacher with an eighth grade education. I come from a family of school teachers, and he taught with an eighth grade education. But he moved on up by getting a job with Consolidation Coal, which took them all over the region, including to Shinston, West Virginia, which is where my dad got his education. Uh, but my, they ended up, my grandmother ended up with a little country store down in uh, Wise County, Virginia. And uh, that, that gave me stories, because I grew up thinking that what you'd call a hillbilly was actually from Virginia, because, you know, Shinston, West Virginia, near Clarksburg, is, it's, a, it's a small town with a working class mm -hmm. population, but it's not, it's not, you know, people, it's not a, a, a spit and whittle sort of place. And, uh, but it really was down there where my grandmother lived. <laughs> so I got ideas there. Um, and interestingly enough, when I write about and for children, it tends to be set in the city. Because even though I certainly wa was a child in West Virginia, did most of my teaching of younger kids in New York City, 
and New Jersey. So I have some books um, called a book called The Secret Superpowers of Marco and Marco's Monster, and I have a young adult book called uh, Melly's Way, and they're very much uh, city kids because that's who I happen to mm -hmm. teach. Well, I taught writing, and they wrote these wonderful pieces that I would then borrow ideas from and, uh, and, and, and write from them. I get, I, I get ideas from everywhere, mm -hmm. which I think is true of most writers. I think you're right. <laughs> <laughs> um, what is the Appalachian Renaissance? Oh, okay. I sort of was hoping you would tell m me what that was because oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know, I know what it is. It was uh, there was a time when people really believed that there was no no creative work of any kind, but particularly writing coming out of here, and that was when they started telling me about um, Davis Grubb, about Mary Lee Settle, mm -hmm. both of whom, of course, left the state as I did. Right. You know, it's very typical. But around the time uh, that I was growing up. There were a number of people who were the children of teachers and other professional people. You, people, folk literature comes out of, from people who are working class, who are close to the, the earth. But when you start writing novels and things like that, it tends to be from people who have a, a professional background of some sort. You know, mm -hmm. So a number of us, and I would include in that group um, well, D Denise Jardina is one of the great examples of the Appalachian Renaissance. I don't actually know what her parents did. I think I think maybe they were minors, but uh, she certainly is educated. Um, and um, uh, Jane Ann Phillips is, has a very similar background to mine from the same area of West Virginia. Um, parents who were teachers, or at least one of the parents. And so a whole group in our, our age cohort all of a sudden got um, national publishers and uh, commercial publishers and began to uh, m make a bit of a, um, a splash outside of Appalachia. And mm -hmm. then since then, it's just been a major flowering. I mean, now you, now you can stay here and be a writer, mm -hmm. uh, which, of course, Denise always did <laughs> anyway. And, and she, she's a wonderful writer, Denise Giardina, because her work with historical things, uh, her novel Storming Heaven about mm -hmm. the mine wars and whatnot is uh, just outstanding. And one of the great things that has happened in recent years is that there are a number of small presses, but also uh, WVU Press has begun uh, taking very seriously all kinds of literature, mm -hmm. but good um, Appalachian, West Virginia literature, and that, that makes a big difference. Uh, in addition to writing, you're also well known as a teacher and public speaker. Can you talk about that part of your career? Well, I, as I said, I, I come from teachers. I mean, I grew up, uh, my dad would, my mother was a homemaker, but she was, uh, you know, a licensed teacher. And he would come home from work, um, and he would tell stories about teaching. Um, and, I mean, it would just be they'd sit down and they'd have coffee and, uh, and cake or pie. We always had coffee or cake or pie, sometimes for breakfast as well as after, after school. And he would simply tell the whole day. And so I grew up listening to, listening to stories about teaching. So it, always, I, it never occurred to me I would do anything except teaching in some form. Now, having mm -hmm. said that, I never had a, a, a full-time teaching job. But, uh, but I, I, I have done writer in the school work for many years in uh, New York and New Jersey mm -hmm. and up there. And also, I teach at uh, New York University. I teach novel writing. So um, it was, it was, it, it, it's a strange question to me because it just seems to me like that's a, that's naturally what, what, what you do. <laughs> um, and the, and the other side of that, of course, is that it's very hard to make a living as a, as a writer, um, and it has been always, but it's much harder now. So, um, so teaching is teaching is great. Teaching is where you, uh, you interact with your readers and you. And you get to learn things about the people, you know. In my novel writing class, I, the things I learn from what they're writing about, not to mention the children. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's um, natural to me. And public speaking, actually, I will say something about that. Okay. That usually comes as a that's a side thing. I get invited to an event like mm -hmm. today's to to say something, or to talking to uh, to classes. Uh, and um, that is, is also something I grew up on because I grew up in um, the, uh, a Baptist church where everybody, it seemed like everybody took a turn preaching. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I, actually, I certainly have heard my father give a sermon and my mother even preached. And, uh, and I was trained 
for better or for worse, in public speaking from the time I was little, you know, I was told, you know, whatever you do, don't, don't wiggle, uh, don't pop your peas. I mean, and, and, and it was, it's interesting, all these people in the Northeast who, who look down on uh, hillbillies <laughs> and out of, out of pure ignorance, uh, they have no idea of how many people were trained in public speaking. And I'm very frustrated by how badly young people, particularly in the Northeast, um, speak. They, they, they're just very poor public speakers, and we were trained in that. Yes, yes we have. <laughs> um, do you ever run into writer's block, and how do you get past that? Um, I, I know a lot of, I have a lot of friends who are writers, and we, we all have different kinds of writer's blocks. Mine tend to happen um, short term. I've never had a major one, and I think it has to do with having been writing since I did those comics mm -hmm. when I was six years old. It's just what I do. However, I do get blocked on a particular project. I tend to have three or four things going at once. Mm -hmm. And when I reach a stage where I've just kind of run out of energy or don't have anything else to say, um, I, um, first of all, I go take a walk or make some coffee or whatever. And if I still don't have anything to say, I switch projects and do something else. But I, 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 I don't recommend that because people are completely different on how this uh, affects them and, and what happens. But for me, it's just a matter of switching projects, switching activities. Writing, whether you're on a computer or writing by hand, is a physically very draining thing. You know, mm -hmm. you have to sit there. I, admi I, I envy um, visual artists, painters, and people who get to use full body motion. You know, you're swinging this paint yes. around. And they, they get a workout. And, and we are sitting on our behinds uh, typing, you know. So you, you need to, you need to, to break, break it a lot. OK. Uh, let's talk about your latest novel, Their Houses. Okay. Well, that's one of the ones I got the idea from on my drive down from the Northeast to, uh, to Shinston. Um, and there, there was a, uh, I used to pass um, a little facility of some kind of, it was like a homemade church, and it was a little tower with a lighthouse on it, and it, was, it had a religious message. And, and it, was, it, it did not appear to be one of the standard uh, Christian mm -hmm. denominations. Uh, and it appeared to be somebody who, who, in my mind, made up his own religion. And I got fascinated by what kind of person that would be, mm -hmm. who he would be. And, and so actually the first character was one of the six point of view characters in that novel, who is a guy who has a pretty, uh, pretty rough life, ends up in prison, um, and, uh, and then starts his own church. And it's about him and his family who do homeschooling and his wife's sister, who's entirely different. And the other thing that stimulated me was in the late 90s, uh, and I'm sure you know of this, there was the, um, the great effort to uh, blow up the Harrison County finger, the FBI fingerprint yes. center. Yes. There was to be a new, and there is, in fact, a, a new facility. It was going to make a huge difference uh, 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 to, the, uh, to the community. And uh, a lot of people decided it was being done by some, you know, the, the New World Order or something like that. And, and, they, and, they, and they got caught immediately because it turns out they were, all the information being fed to them was from an FBI agent. So it was a real, it was a real dumb kind of thing and, and a little bit humorous. And I decided to use that. I actually used that historically. And just my fiction part was that my, my ultimate preacher got involved in it. Um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, sidelong. He wasn't deep, deeply involved in it, but enough that he goes to jail. So, and and uh, you know, and I, I could go on like that forever because I, I really do believe that novels, in particular, y you use everything. You know, mm -hmm. you use a dream you once had. You use something out of the news. You use uh, people you've met. Certainly, people you've met, faces, voices. It's all grist for the mill. Thank you, Meredith. We look forward to reading more of your work. Uh, we'll have more on libraries today after this. It takes less than one minute to find out if you may have prediabetes, and you can do it here. So what are you waiting for? Just go to the site. One of the most important functions of the Library Commission is to provide library services for the blind and physically handicapped. The Commission's Special Services Division administers the regional library serving West Virginia for the National Library Service for the Blind and Physically Handicapped. It provides direct library services to more than 2,000 West Virginians 
who cannot utilize standard size print because of blindness, visual impairment, or disability. It's a big job. And with me now to talk about it is special services librarian, Jasmine Lewis Combs. Jasmine, thanks for being with us. Thank you for having me. So what do you consider the primary purpose of the special services library? The special services library is, is just what you say. It's the public library for those West Virginians that can't utilize standard print. Whether they can't see it because of a visual impairment or blindness, maybe they can't hold a book um, because they have a physical disability, maybe they're bed fast, um, maybe they even have an allergy to something in the book that the materials, the ink or um, the paper makeup. So any of those types of disabilities, you also, we serve traumatic brain injury, autism, um, anything, any kind of disability we can access different prints for these individuals. How do residents access the services? The service, it's an application process. Um, the application can be found on the Special Services website, on the Library Commission's website, or you can use the National Library Service application. Once you complete that application, you send it back to us, and then we send you the materials of your choice, whether that be large print or braille um, or the talking book audiobooks. I think most people, when they think about services for the blind, think about braille services. But as you mentioned, it's much more than that. And, and talking books particularly, I think, have, have really come to the forefront. They really have. Um, our talking book program continues to grow and it's, it's changing. The technology is changing as we move forward. Um, we you know, have used the standard talking book machine for about 10 years now. And in the coming years, there's going to be a refreshable braille program uh, that's coming. And in addition to machines that will be wireless, being that they get the books instead of off the cartridge, it's like a flash drive, they're going to get these machines and the books are going to come to them through Wi-Fi or through a cell service. I understand you're working on a new project. It's Duplication on Demand. What we, is that? We are. Duplication on Demand is it's more patron-centric. Um, instead of having this rows and rows and rows of books on the shelf or the talking book cartridges on the shelf, we have put all of these books onto a computer and it has a huge database built into it that connects to our automation system. Then instead of sending patrons one book on one cartridge, we can send them 10 books or 20 books on one cartridge. So that makes it easier for us to save manpower because we're not spending hours a day, you know, making shelves, shelving books and, you know, cleaning books, pulling books, putting mail cards together, all of those things. Now all we have to do is to take the cartridge, plug it into the computer, it loads it, it prints us a mail card uh, for that patron that has a nice list of all the books that are on it and then we send it out. So it's saving us a huge amount of manpower and it is better for our patrons because a lot of our patrons live in high-rise apartments, small places, they have very small mailboxes. So if they want 10 or 12 books, you know, they can't get all those in, in the mailbox. How have the patrons reacted so far? Most of our patrons have been very receptive and have you know, really appreciated the service because they're able to get more books at a time. Um, you know, we're doing five books with five cartridges with 20 books to a cartridge. So they're getting 100 books at a time, whereas previously they might get five or 10. Right. Um, so most of our patrons really like it. Now for the ones that do not, we are still doing one book, one cartridge with the same type program. Um, the only difference with this is the type, the way the machine and the cartridge look. So right now they're coming in this lovely clear container. Mm -hmm. Instead of having the book printed on the cartridge it just says talking book West Virginia you know and then the back of it is just a little bit different previously our patrons would pull out the mail card mm -hmm. and turn it over to send it to back to us now our address is already printed on the container mm -hmm. so they can just pull out the lovely little mail card that has this one's addressed to me here at the Capitol mm -hmm. and on that it also has their list of books so when they get this, they can just recycle it um, at home and send this back to us. 
That sounds very neat. It, it's a wonderful program. I've also heard the term assistive, assistive technology. What is that? Assistive technology is talking books, and it is all the different devices that we use um, for, to accommodate for disability. Now, there's high level or low tech. Okay, so your higher tech is going to be like the talking book machine, the refreshable braille machine, um, the Victor Reader Streams. All of those devices, you could even say an iPad or a, an iPhone can be used as assistive technology. Now your lower tech devices are gonna be things like a crutches or um, a walking boot um, or you know things like that, large print could be. It's anything that you do to modify the regular process and to make that accessible to a wider variety of people. What role do public libraries play in the day-to-day -day operations of special services? Because I guess they, you know, obviously those patrons from around the state are closer to some of the public libraries. So how do they interact with you folks? Absolutely. We, we do a couple of different things with the public libraries. We do offer a rotating collection, um, especially of our large print materials. We'll send out this deposit collection to the libraries to supplement their large print because we have a very extensive large print collection. We also do um, the audio collections as deposit collections. We'll issue the machine to a library and send those out. Now, the biggest thing is we want our public libraries to know we are here and we are here to support the patrons in West Virginia. So when your patrons start coming in and they start saying, we can't use the library anymore because we can't see or we can't hold the book, then you know that we are there and you can print out that application and give those patrons that information to get in touch with us and to help them get signed up. But basically the public libraries, they just need to know that we're here and we're here mm -hmm. to offer support to them. Jasmine, thanks for spending some time and, and, and good luck with the new program. Thank you. <laughs> we'll have more on Libraries Today right after this. Welcome to Understood.org, a free online resource for parents of kids with learning and attention issues with personalized recommendations, tools, and daily access to experts to help your child thrive. Understood.org, because understanding is everything. West Virginia public libraries play a vital role in the lives of thousands of Mountain State residents. Over the years, state libraries have provided a solid foundation and been an inspiration for generations of West Virginia authors. And for more than 2,000 state residents, the State Library for the Blind and Physically Handicapped has provided a crucial link to reading and learning for those who don't have the luxury of walking into a public library on their own and picking up a good book. Public libraries are often a critical component in enriching the lives of West Virginians by serving as a center for community life. I'd like to thank my guests for being on today's show. West Virginia author Meredith Sue Willis, WVLC Library and Development Director Heather campbell Shock, and Special Services Librarian Jasmine Lewis Combs. I'm Stan Howe, thanks for watching. We'll see you next time on Libraries Today.